Good morning, and thank you for joining us for a very special Facebook Live. My name is Edna Friedberg, and I'm a historian at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. Those of you who have tuned into our shows before will notice something a little bit different today. Our museum is closed, as is much of the United States and much of the world due to coronavirus. But learning about the history of the Holocaust doesn't have to stop. So we are coming to you today and in the coming weeks live from our homes. Uh, our guest today is my colleague, senior historian, Patricia Heberer-Rice. Hi, Patricia. Hi, Edna. It's great to see you. It's nice to see you, too, since we don't get to see each other in person these days. Yes. We are grateful for your patience, viewers, if we experience any technical glitches this first time out of the gate doing uh, the program this way. In these difficult times, we are committed to connecting you with Holocaust history and stories that inspire, that empower, that engage. As people around the world grapple with the challenges of coronavirus, we are focusing on stories of resilience, of generosity and courage. I have been a Holocaust historian for more than two decades. And I imagine that I also speak for Patricia when I say that when you tell people that this is what you do for a living, they often say, oh, that must be incredibly depressing. And of course it is. It is not easy, it is very painful and hard uh, to study and to teach about cruelty and violence on such a massive scale. But it is also inspiring to learn about the glimmers of hope, uh, the inspiring stories that occasionally you run across of unimaginable kindness, compassion, and bravery. And today we'll be focusing on one such story. We will introduce you to a couple, Jan and Antonina Jabinski. Jan Jabinski was the director of the Warsaw Zoo in the 1930s, and his wife, Antonina, uh, was his partner in every way. This ordinary couple rescued close to 300 Jews, and their story was told in the 2017 movie, The Zookeeper's Wife. Uh, we'll be looking at the real history behind the movie today. And please do send us your questions. Uh, we will answer as many of them as we can, post them in the comments question. So to start, Patricia, let's start by setting the scene. The Zabinskis uh, uh, operated a popular zoo in Warsaw, the capital city in Poland. After the Nazi invasion, Nazi German invasion in 1939, September, how did life change immediately for people in Warsaw? Well, the Germans described this invasion of Poland as a blitzkrieg or lightning war, and certainly the invasion of Poland proceeded very rapidly. By about the first week of the campaign, the Germans reached Warsaw, which is about in the middle east of the country. Uh, and they laid siege to the town. Uh, and at this point, uh, there was unrestricted aerial bombardment of the city. Um, about 40% of uh, the buildings uh, in Warsaw were seriously damaged during this first several weeks of World War uh, II. Uh, unfortunately, the zoo was right by an artillery area. The zoo is the cradle of our story today. And unfortunately, it was very heavily bombed during the campaign. Many of the animals were murdered. There was a lot of destruction at the zoo. Uh, in the last week of September, uh, Warsaw capitulated and shortly thereafter the Polish army. And the, uh, you're seeing here the destruction uh, in one neighborhood of Warsaw uh, from some of that bombing that I just described. And um, the occupation that ensued was completely brutal. Um, for Gentile Poles, but especially for Polish Jews. Uh, the Polish Jews, uh, uh, Warsaw Jews had to wear a special armband. They didn't wear a star in their chest like a lot of Jews. They wore a white armband with the Star of David. There were many restrictions. Uh, thousands of civilians were killed in the very early weeks uh, after uh, the occupation began. And in October 1940, about a year later, uh, the Germans instituted the Warsaw Ghetto, which they sealed the following month in November, sealing about 400,000 uh, Polish Warsaw Jews uh, in about an area less than two square miles, so a very part, small part of the city, and separating them from their Polish Gentile neighbors. And within the ghetto, this urban prison zone, if you will, um, you talk about the overcrowding, but that also led to um, intense starvation, uh, exploitation of the people there as slave laborers, the spread of disease. Um, it was truly uh, hell on earth. Exactly, exactly. Very apt description. So what about the Jabinskis, first of all, gave them insight into what was happening to the Jews in prison there and also motivated 
the two of them um, to engage in rescue efforts. Yeah, the Davinskis, these were really very interesting people and both of their childhoods in some way shaped them to have the potential to be rescuers. Antonina was born in St. Petersburg, which is today Russia. And in that time was Tsarist Russia. You see her there on the right. Um, and her parents perished uh, in the uh, Russian Civil War after the Bolshevik Revolution. And so I think this gave her an empathy with victims of uh, war and violence. She was already known at the time our movie starts, or the book starts, the story starts, uh, as, a, an, as an author. She was a children's author. She wrote a lot about the children and uh, the animals uh, that they lived with in the zoo. Uh, Jan, for his part, he grew up in a, a largely Jewish neighborhood, and I think this gave him a certain empathy for uh, Jews that carried with him his entire life. Uh, he was a famous zoologist, a very prominent man in the Warsaw community, and he was the co-founder of the Warsaw Zoo, and he was the director of that zoo uh, from 1929 until 1951. Uh, both of these people were very, very interesting. They kept an eclectic house. They lived on the grounds of the zoo. A lot of artists, a lot of intellectuals there. And he was so prominent that the Nazis actually, after their occupation, named him the superintendent of city parks. So he was definitely a prominent man, even as far as the Nazis were concerned. And uh, Jan Jabinski's appointment as superintendent of parks actually gave him uh, access in a way that an average civilian would not. Is that correct? Yes, exactly. We'll get to that in, a, in just, a, just a minute. Yeah, exactly. Um, I want to turn a little bit to the film The Zookeeper's Wife because uh, some of our viewers may have seen it before and uh, often when we watch a movie that's based on a true story or inspired by true events, we want to know what's real, what's not. So one of the major plot lines in that movie uh, shows that the zoo attracted the attention of a high-ranking Nazi official. Uh, was there in fact such a person? Is this based on a, a real historical figure? That's an excellent question. Yes, this guy was an actual figure. Uh, his name was Ludwig or Lutz. He went by Lutz Heck. He was a very famous zoologist, as was his father before him. He was the director of the Berlin Zoo, one of the great zoos uh, still to this day. <coughs> well known to the Zabinskis because he was a colleague uh, before the war, of course, in the international community of zoologists. Uh, and he was, uh, he was, had sort of a special treatment in the Nazi hierarchy because he was a hunting buddy of Hermann Göring, of course, a very high ranking Nazi official. And when Warsaw falls, he comes and he confronts the Hex. Uh, and he, uh, he confronts the Zabinskis. Yeah, sorry. Uh, That's okay. Yes, indeed. And he confronts the Jabinskis and he uh, does what he later gets in a lot of hot water for uh, from Soviet officials. Uh, he uh, pilfered a lot of animals, not only in Warsaw, but from other zoos as well, the rare, exotic, valuable animals. And then as we saw in the um, uh, film, tragically, he arranged for the rest of the animals in the zoo to be killed. Uh, he was not the rapist and homicidal maniac that we see in the picture. This actually was a composite of, of different experiences that just the Zabinskis had over time. Uh, but he was uh, uh, not a nice guy when it came to these animals, uh, especially. So, um, uh, but in any case, because the zoo was emptied, it was used for some time as a hog farm and the Zabinskis still lived on the property. I think it's really significant that you highlight, uh, even though he was not, uh, Lutz Heck was not involved in violent crimes himself, that he pillaged zoos all across occupied Europe. Uh, you have to keep in mind that violent crimes were not the only crimes of the Holocaust and it also involved theft on an industrial scale. Uh, exactly. Effects are often still felt today. Um, but that also meant that in terms of practicalities, the Zabinski Zoo in Warsaw is now more or less an empty zoo and that actually provides an opportunity, did it not? Um, yes, how did the zoo function as a place of refuge in its new um, empty state? Right, so um, the zoo was uh, relatively uh, cl clean and empty at that point. And we talked a little bit earlier about the fact that his role as superintendent of the parks 
uh, in Warsaw gave him leeway in freedom of movement to move around the city to see the plight of Jews. Uh, and it also gave him access to the Warsaw Ghetto. And so very early on, he is actually entering the Warsaw Ghetto and the Zhabinskis are starting to help uh, people that they know. And uh, as we see in the, in, the, in the movie, he is also sometimes smuggling people outside of the ghetto. You see uh, the Warsaw Ghetto um, uh, as it looked at the time uh, with Jews separated from the uh, uh, fellow Poles on the outside of the ghetto. Uh, he immediately begins to bring people to the house, and we have that charming. Uh, as there was the, the there was actually a, a um, um, Nazi occupation officials at the perimeter of the zoo, and we have that charming footage of um, um, Antonina coming to play her piano uh, when the um, Nazis came onto the properties. That warned the people that were actually in the house some of whom stay for a very long time um, uh, to uh, hide uh, that the Nazis were coming and approaching the house. So she would play the piano as a sign of danger, as a signal. Okay. Correct, but you also asked me about the, the fact that the zoo was empty. And if you've ever been behind the scenes in a zoo, you know that the animals are usually out or in enclosures where you can see them. But on the back side, there are all these tunnels and, uh, and uh, indoor enclosures where the animals go in, in during the night in inclement weather. And it was here that they began to hide about 300 Jews, some for some time, some for a very long time, months, even years, uh, before they could find safe housing for them. I'd like to pause for a minute to thank our viewers from all over the United States and also who are watching us from places such as Rome, Sydney, Australia, and the Philippines. Uh, we typically do have a lot of long distance viewers on Facebook Live, but knowing that so many of us are isolated in our homes, it feels especially good to be connected with you this way. So thank you. Thank you for joining us and please do send your questions. Um, so to be clear, I wanna make sure I'm following you right, Patricia. Some people were hidden in the Jabinski's private home, a couple of dozen, right, on the grounds of the zoo, and others uh, were in animal enclosures or smuggled out using these underground tunnels that predated the war. Is that right? That's absolutely correct. And of course, the Jabinski's had helpers that were able to uh, bring people out into safe houses. And most of these people incredibly and miraculously survived the war. Um, they, the Jabinskis, among other individuals whom they rescued, uh, was Rachel Arbach. She's a very significant individual. Uh, she is part and part of the leadership of the Onyx Shabbat uh, archive. Um, and there you see a very famous milk can. That is one of the most valuable things in our collection. Uh, Emmanuel Ringelblum, an historian, worked with Arbach and others to archive the um, life and uh, times of the Warsaw Ghetto because they knew eventually the ghetto would be liquidated. And at the end of the war, uh, much of this archive was buried in milk cans like this uh, at the liquidation of the Warsaw Ghetto. Uh, the Jabinskis helped to save Rachel Auerbach. Uh, she actually gave Jan her diary, which was buried uh, for hiding on the zoo grounds. And in the post-war, uh, she survived and was able to help um, officials locate milk cans like this one that contained what is now called the Ring of Blue Archive, one of the most valuable resources we have for life in the Warsaw Ghetto. And for people who may not have heard of this uh, secret archive of the Warsaw Ghetto before, the milk can, which you just saw, which is quite a, quite a large object, it's very large, yes. Five. Um, is on display in our permanent exhibition here in Washington, one of just three such milk cans that have been unearthed. Um, it's really a time capsule. That's why it looks so uh, encrusted with soil and mineral buildups. It was underground um, as a voice to a future that the residents of the ghetto were not sure that they would live to tell. And so the these are also part of the story. And if you look in our comments section to this broadcast, uh, you can explore more links about the Warsaw Ghetto and about this window into its, um, its life. Um, you do mention also, Patricia, that the Jabinskis did not work alone. 
And that brings me to uh, another point about risks. Uh, when you talked about Lutz Heck as having been their colleague before, that Jan, Jan Jabinski grew up in a Jewish neighborhood, it is an important reminder that people did not come uh, to experience the events of World War II and the Holocaust with a blank slate. They brought in the relationships and connections that they had from before the war, whether good or bad. And Jan Jabinski indeed was part of larger networks of resistors, is that right? That's absolutely correct. He was part of the Polish Home Army. So in addition to all of these people, that's an underground resistance. Uh, uh, part of the Polish Army remained in attack and they went underground after the capitulation of Poland and their part of that uh, underground resistance is Zagoda, uh, which is a council to help Jews, which helped the, uh, the Zabinskis to uh, fund some of these individuals to get them rations that they needed to feed these 300 individuals they helped to save. And part of Rian's work was also to work with the very dangerous issue of uh, forging false documents. Forced documents were incredibly important for people who uh, were Jews in hiding, for people who had gone on the bad side of the Nazis and needed to hide their identities. Uh, and uh, John, uh, Jan Jabowski was very integral in doing things like this as well. Very risky. The uh, Jabinskis had two children by the end of the war. They had a son, uh, Richard, which we've seen, pardon my Polish. <laughs> And then uh, Teresa, who is born, as we see in the movie, during the last part of uh, World War II, uh, before uh, Warsaw was liberated. So it's a very risky business. And when you're talking about these forged documents, we need to remember that a piece of paper could mean the difference between life and death. These are forged documents that allowed people, whether Jews or Christian Poles who were identified and targeted as enemies of the Germans, of Nazi Germany, uh, it enabled them to hide in plain sight using an assumed identity uh, that would protect them. And so Jan Jabinski was part of this. I also wanna make sure that people understand that the 300 or so people we're talking about, most of them did not stay for the duration of the war on the zoo, but many of them passed through uh, the zoo en route to other, other hiding places. Uh, Patricia, we have a viewer question. Um, Kay from Canada is asking, uh, I had to cancel a course that was going to take students to Europe to study the Holocaust this May. And we're sorry, Kay, we know there are so many um, situations like that. The Warsaw Zoo was one of our stops. So thank you so much for doing this. Actually, it's a thanks. I just didn't read it. Oh, today. that's wonderful. And today, as we'll see, the Warsaw Zoo is a, is a wonderful zoo, one of the great prestigious zoos of Europe. So it grew back, as we'll see in just a moment. Well, Kay, we hope you get to do, take your trip at another time. But in the meantime, uh, please know that the Holocaust Museum here in Washington, we are here as a resource for you. We have a lot of digital online offerings. Uh, we have also a recording of a program that we did in 2017 with the uh, director of The Zookeeper's Wife with Jessica Chastain, the star. Um, so if you'd like to watch and then watch a kind of post-film discussion with your students, maybe that's a way that you could uh, continue with the distance learning. Uh, Patricia, we have a viewer named Becca who is asking whether the Jabinskis received Yad Vashem, Israel's National Holocaust Memorial, whether they have been recognized by Yad Vashem as righteous among the nations. Yes. Uh, should I maybe tell the story of what happens to these people? Yeah, I think then we'll get to her question. As yeah, of yeah that, maybe, so. maybe we should address that part of the story. You're so chronological, you must <laughs> be <boring. laughs> It's an historian's thing. Yeah. Uh, so uh, as I said, Jan was in the uh, home army. And in 1944, uh, this home army rose up in uh, rebellion against the Nazi occupiers. This shouldn't be confused with the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, which took place the year before. This was in summer of 44. And the Red Army, the Soviet Army, was coming uh, uh, to uh, you know, basically uh, very close to Warsaw. And at this point, the Home Army rose up. Hopefully, they would be able to take the first storm and then the Soviets would come in. For reasons that are debated today, the Soviets did not uh, push forward and the rebellion was crushed. And Jan uh, was injured and taken as a prisoner to Germany. Uh, thereafter, Antonina, she stays 
uh, she's thinking that Jan is killed, as we saw in the movie, and she continues to care for the Jews and the people who need her back at the zoo. And uh, Jan comes uh, home after World War II in 1947. He's still the director of the zoo, and that's a position he holds until 1951. And at, there they are again. Um, and, and in later life, as you can see, um, this credit is yet from Yad Vashem, so you know it's coming. Um, they, he stays in that role until 1951, and he repopulates the zoo starting in 1947. And as our, as our questioner rightly suggests, in 1965, as probably on the basis of uh, Antonina's um, diary, which she chronologued this whole story, um, she and her husband received the uh, title Righteous Among Nations. It's, um, it's an honor bestowed by Yad Vashem, our sister uh, institution in Israel, for non-Jews who save Jews uh, at great risk to their personal safety and without reward for doing so. So yes, they did receive that honor. And to place this in context also, the penalties across Nazi-occupied Europe were not equal for helping Jews in every place. And as Patricia had noted at the outset, the Nazi German occupation of Poland was exceptionally brutal uh, within the Nazis' race, racist and racial hierarchy and ideology. Slavic peoples, such as Poles, were considered inferior. And the uh, penalties for helping Jews in Poland could be death for the rescuer themselves. So not only were Jan and Antonina putting their own lives directly at risk to help, in many cases, total strangers, they were also risking the lives of their two young children. Uh, for no reward whatsoever. Uh, so their, their heroism is truly, truly incredible. And they continue to do it for years and years and years, every day making the decision to continue doing this work. Patricia, do you have any final thoughts um, about this history? And actually, forget it, I'm gonna read instead of question first and then you can respond. Um, viewer Danielle from Laurel, Maryland, so not far from where we are right now is saying, um, stories like this one make you question your own courage. Would people today, would she have this kind of courage? She says she does not know. What does a story like this make you think about, Patricia, before we close? Well, I think, I think we talked a little bit about the backgrounds of these individuals and that they had already some kind of formative background, particularly Antonina, uh, with her experience as a child in the Russian Civil War that made her empathetic to people who are, uh, who are uh, victims of violence and war. I think for some, it's that background. For some, it's simply empathy. Uh, I think here too, uh, they began helping people whom they knew uh, and then they reached out to helping people who were completely unknown to them. And I, there's no one consensus about rescuers, but um, a lot of rescuers have altruism. And I think when it comes right down to it, both Antonina and her husband, Jan, they just knew it was the right thing to do and were willing to take, as you point out, considerable risks to themselves and to their children uh, to do so. Incredible courage. And I, I, it's, it's difficult to know what one would do in, in times like this, uh, but the, Jabinski certainly rose to the occasion and took enormous risks and they saved hundreds of lives. And today they have, you know, probably uh, thousands of people uh, who uh, came into the world because these 300 people uh, survived. And that's, that's an honor beyond Yad Vashem's. I think sometimes, uh, uh, Danielle, in answer to your question also, when you look at testimonies from many uh, rescuers all across Europe during this period, most of them seem even a little perplexed when asked, why did they rescue? I think they felt like, what else would they do? That it was the human or moral or ethical thing, but that it almost seemed like more of an impulse than a decision. And I think we often don't know what is inside a person until they are, are tested. Um, fortunately, few of us will be tested the way the Jabinskis and others uh, were during this period, but we can certainly see, although they are a minority, they are not unique, and that that is part of uh, the human, human capacity for good. Um, I did want to ask you, uh, Patricia, if you could talk a little bit more um, about some of the, 
the, the scientific elements. You are an expert on um, Nazi medical ethics and doctors, and you had hinted earlier about uh, Lutz Heck and his pillaging of animals. Um, if you could talk a moment about that. Yeah, um, what's very interesting about Lutz Heck is he was well known already in the 1920s. He and his brother, his brother ran Heinz, uh, interestingly enough, an anti-Nazi who went to Dachau in 1933. He had a Jewish wife for a time. That was his brother. His brother went to a concentration camp. Correct, to a concentration camp. As a, as a, he was also a communist. So the two of these brothers in the 1920s begin to do what's called backbreeding. Uh, backbreeding was the idea, and this is long before DNA. We, we don't have the double helix. And the two brothers thought they could bring back, literally kind of bring back uh, animals that had gone extinct in the, extinct in the wild. Uh, they're usually working with herd animals, things like horses and cattle. Uh, and they tried to use domesticated stock that were the, um, that were the um, sort of the descendants of animals like the aurochs, who was, was extinct in Poland in 1621, so had been extinct for a long time. Of course, in retrospect, they couldn't do this, uh, and the animals really didn't resemble the extinct animals it, physically or by DNA either, but there are uh, heck cattle and heck horses today in small herds still in Europe from these experiments that were done uh, to breed animals uh, through the Heck brothers. This was done in the 20s, so it wasn't really a Nazi thing to make, you know, the perfect animal, uh, but it did have a eugenic component. Um, so that, you know, eugenics is something that's embraced by Nazi leadership. So it does sound a little Nazi-like, but it's it preceded the Nazi era. And you see that in Heck uh, trying to breed this kind of bison on, on the zoo grounds uh, in the movie. Right, and that is part of the plot, and I think also reminds us that there was this scientific or pseudo-scientific um, veneer that was put over much of what was happening during this period of time, and that in fact made the Nazis seem like a progressive um, data-based movement um, right. that some people kind of opportunistically attach themselves to. Um, we are running out of time. Um, I do want to remind people that there will be links posted in our comments where you can explore these issues, the questions of rescue, of ethics, of the occupation of Poland um, in our comments section. Um, but today, really, we want to pay tribute to Jan and Antonina Zabinski. Um, Patricia, thank you very much for joining us. My pleasure. And for helping us to understand the selfless actions of one couple who, as you said, um, are really responsible for lives of thousands of people who otherwise um, would not be alive today. Uh, the history of the Holocaust demonstrates for us the extremes of human behavior in times of crisis, obviously the capacity for evil, but also selflessness beyond all measure. And stories like Jan and Antonina's uh, illustrate how the personal choices of ordinary people can not only help and boost others, but in times of uh, extreme duress, even save lives. And we often don't know our own potential or strength until it is tested. So on behalf of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, I'd like to thank you again for watching. Uh, we hope you will join us next week, same time next week, 9.30 a.m. on Wednesday, Eastern Standard Time, sorry, Eastern Daylight Time. And uh, we look forward to seeing you then. Take care, everybody, wherever you are. Bye-bye.